A reading from Psalms 89. I will sing of your steadfast love, O Lord. Forever with my mouth I will proclaim your faithfulness to all generations. I declare that your steadfast love is established forever. Your faithfulness is as firm as the heavens. You said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to my servant David. I will establish your descendants forever and build your throne for all generations. Selah. Happy are the people who know about the festival shower, who walk, O Lord, in the light of your countenance. They exult in your name all day long and exult your righteousness. For you are the glory of their strength. By your favor, our horn is exalted. For our shields belong to the Lord, our King to the Holy One of Israel. Word of God, Word of Life. A reading from Romans. Therefore, do not let sin exercise dominion in your mortal bodies, but to make you obey their passions. No longer present your members to sin as instruments of wickedness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and present your members to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Should we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? By no means. Do, not, do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you, having once been slaves, have become obedient from the heart to the form of teaching to which you were entrusted, and that you, having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your limited, natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to greater and greater iniquity, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness for sanctification. When you were slaves of sin, you were free in regards to righteousness. So what advantage did you then get from the things of which you now are ashamed. The end of those things is death. But now that you've been freed from slave, free from sin and enslaved to God, the advantage you get is sanctification. The end is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Word of God, word of life. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Whoever welcomes you, welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me, welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a, re a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please bow your heads with me in a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the gift of this day and for the opportunity to, uh, to hear and share your word, to share in prayer, to come before you with our needs, with our concerns, and with our joys. And God, we pray in this moment that you would open up our hearts to receive your word with faith, with trust that you are doing a good work in us. Help us to live not for ourselves, but always for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Have you noticed um, how few people these days respond to the words, thank you, with your welcome? Um, I know there are plenty of people who still use the phrase, and it's still 
probably the most common thing. But I find that uh, as I say thank you to others, uh, it's just as common or maybe even more common that I hear phrases not like you're welcome, but uh, most of the time what I hear is sure thing or uh, no problem, right? Uh, so I say thank you and they say no problem. I didn't know it was a problem. I was just glad that they did it. But that's the response that we get. Chick-fil-A uh, actually teaches their workers uh, to respond to thank you with the words, uh, my pleasure, which makes for an interesting and kind of entertaining game whenever you go to Chick-fil-A. Uh, next time you go there, uh, see how many ways, see how many things you can find to thank them for and uh, find out how many my pleasure responses you can get in just one visit. It's good fun and uh, a good practice for us in saying thank you as well. Actually, the most common place I see the words you're welcome used today is in texting. Although when I get a text, it's usually just a YW, right? perhaps with a smiley emoji at the end. In our gospel today, Jesus makes a big deal, makes a big deal about the phrase, you're welcome. We often turn this text around because we're so interested in what we have to do. But the text itself is not a command. It's a promise. It says, as Jesus says, when, when, others, when anyone welcomes you, they welcome me. Jesus points out how welcome is a gift of grace that comes to us because of him. Jesus has been talking with his disciples uh, about going out to serve, about uh, serving others and going out to witness and to tell others the good news of his kingdom and what Jesus is about and to help others understand what this mission is that we share in his name. Um, he's been talking about going out and sharing his gifts of healing, of peace, joy, truth, and love with the world around them. And as we do this, um, Jesus has been warning the disciples over the past couple of weeks that as they go out in this mission, not everyone will welcome them. In fact, as you might recall, Jesus said that they should expect that many would not welcome them, that many would reject them, turn them away, or even persecute them. Jesus prepared his disciples for this difficult journey by making sure that their expectations were not that it would be easy. In today's gospel, he continues pointing out that while the journey will not be filled with welcome and rejoicing at every turn, there are places where you will experience welcome and generosity, and kindness. And when that comes to you, when we experience that, we can celebrate that, but we should also recognize that it comes to us not because of us, but because of Jesus. That when we experience welcome, it comes because of Jesus, just as the rejection and persecution come because of Jesus. Jesus is making the point to his followers that as they live for him in the world, the world will respond to them as they're responding to him. In fact, the world will respond to Jesus through his followers. I tell you what, Throughout my life, I have always uh, kind of struggled 
with a desire to uh, make sure that everybody that I knew, everybody that was close to me, everybody I was encountering felt good about me. I wanted them to like me, to accept me, to feel like, yeah, hey, I'm glad you're around. And there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, I think most of us want to be liked and accepted. In fact, uh, most of us would far prefer being liked and accepted to the alternative, right? But the issue becomes when being liked and accepted for who I am becomes more important than doing and saying what God has called me to do and say. And it becomes even more so when I'm more concerned about being liked and accepted for what I do and say than for what God has made me to be, for who I really am in God's eyes. This is what Jesus has been talking about with the disciples in the gospel for the past couple of weeks. Remember last week um, when Jesus pointed out that uh, to be fit to be his disciple uh, means putting Jesus above everything and everyone in your life, letting Jesus have first priority, letting Jesus determine our steps, letting Jesus guide where we go next. This is the call of the disciple. This is the work of that we share as individuals and as a community of faith. So just like I get caught up in trying to please everyone else, the church also gets caught up in trying to please everyone else, especially to please the audience uh, or the particular someone else that we're trying to attract uh, at that time. We get caught up trying to draw people in that we have chosen and we've said, oh, I really want this group to feel good about us. Instead of focusing on the guidance of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, and the mission of making him known. We start to measure our success as a congregation by the number of people who come to our worship services, who attend our Bible studies, who support our mission with their offerings. The true measure of our success as a Christian community is not about these things. And it may be more difficult to measure than them, but it is immensely more important. The true measure of our success as a Christian community is how well do we represent Christ in our relationships with others? How much do they see Christ in us? In our readings over the last few weeks, Jesus has made clear that as we go out into the world in Jesus' name to represent him, not everyone will receive this message with joy and excitement. We won't always be liked. We won't always be welcomed. Many times our representation of Christ is met with denial, with ridicule, with persecution, with hardship. Jesus has been clear that as disciples, as followers of him, we should not be surprised when these difficulties come. We should expect them. And we can take solace knowing that it's not unusual. As if we personally have somehow gotten it wrong and the only reason the world is reacting this way to this message is because we've done it wrong, we've said it wrong, or we've did it wrong in some way. That's not the case, Jesus says. After all, The world also rejected, denied, and turned against Jesus. So when that happens to us, it may have less to do with us and more to do with Jesus. In other words, 
We don't have to take it personally. Today in the Gospel reading, Jesus goes on to make clear that that works on the other side of the equation too. That just as rejection and hardship come on account of him, so too welcome and blessing come on account of Jesus. As Jesus says it, whoever welcomes you welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Jesus wants us to understand that when our representation is met with welcome, it's still not about us. It's all about him. Now, what makes this so difficult for me is that my focus is often on, well, me. How are people responding to me? How are people perceiving me? What is it about me that I am showing to others? Do people understand me? Do they know who I am? Am I presenting myself in the best way possible? These are the questions that our society teaches us over and over again to work at, to craft, to fashion, so that we can be and show others the very best representation of who we are, who we want to be. The focus always ends up being pointing back to me. So that when others reject what I am presenting, I feel it is a rejection of me. When others receive with joy what I am presenting, I feel it as a reception of me. It's all very personal. But Jesus wants his followers to understand that we don't have to live that way. We don't have to take it personally. After all, as Jesus followers, as Christians, our life is not about how well we represent ourselves, how well we present ourselves to others. Instead, it's about how well we represent Christ and how well we present Christ to others. When our focus is on representing Christ, we can begin to understand that when we are rejected, we don't have to take it personally. And when we are welcomed, we might not take that personally either. It isn't about us. Anyway, it's about Christ. That's true of everything we do, big and small. As Jesus says later in our gospel, anyone who gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones, and by little ones, he doesn't mean little in stature. Instead, uh, Jesus means uh, the insignificant, the overlooked, the ones who have little power and authority, the vulnerable, the needy. And so when Jesus says, whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones, what he's getting at is that if anyone serves them, no matter who it is, in any way, will not go unnoticed. Just as there are moments of rejection that come as a result of representing Christ, so too there will be moments of welcome and blessing, of being served and receiving blessing, big and small, and we can rejoice 
in them and we can rejoice with those who bring them to us but our rejoicing is not about how much we deserve it or how uh, great it is that it has come to us but how wonderful it is that God has empowered us to live together and to celebrate the opportunity we have to show kindness to one another and the reward that every kindness brings, not only to those it's given to, but to those who give that kindness. You see, all of it comes to us, not because we have done such a remarkable job of being generous and kind and loving people, more so than everybody else, so, so that uh, we deserve it. No, it comes to us because God's Spirit has brought God's people together. And that is so wonderful when it happens. There is a place in God's name where we are brought together by the Spirit of God, where we feel that welcome and we know it has come to us. It comes to you. You're welcome. You are welcome because of Christ. You are welcome because he is welcome. And where he is not welcome, it shouldn't surprise us that we are not welcome either. Dear friends, may we live in the welcome of Christ, knowing that the welcome is its own reward. That when we feel that love and acceptance, that belonging that is extended to us by the grace of God, it comes to us because we represent Christ and someone has seen Christ in us, someone worthy of serving. This is the good news and this is how we are to live. This is what brings us to rejoice as a community of faith and it is also what guides and shapes how we extend welcome and who we welcome. Who do we look for? Are we going to focus on whether or not uh, they, uh, this person or that person does things in a way that we would want them to do it? Or can we welcome others purely because we know that their heart is connected to Christ, that they are working to represent him and to do that well? When we welcome one another as Christ, as part of the kingdom of God, the spirit and the father who has sent him to shape a new world, when we welcome others in this way, we extend our arms to a world that is ready to rejoice and that needs to be welcomed. We know the goodness and joy that it brings to us to be welcomed by another. And so we too extend that welcome to those who come to us, whoever they are. And we do it in Jesus' name. So don't take it personally. It's not about you. It never was. Not in the rejection, not in the welcome. It's all about Christ. And in Christ, all have a place. You're welcome.